It is a joy again for me to be with you. If you're listening to me either on WhatsApp or on the, on the Facebook or YouTube channels, wonderful to be able to think about the word of God, to present it to you, hopefully with you finding what God intended to be one of the most satisfying, soul enriching things of life. And that is to find your identity in a God who cares about every single detail about you. And I'm thankful that I've learned that. But I wouldn't say everybody knows that, and that's why we're here. I'm just going to go to our um, details. I'm just going to give them to you quickly, especially if you're reading from, if you are on WhatsApp. Um, I'm just going to give you our email address and our phone number. If you're watching, you can come back to the point where the screen is up and just take the details from there. But I'm going to give you the email, the phone number, and I'm just going to give you mine because you can always get hold of me and then I'll get hold of Lauren if you wanted to deal with her. So let me show you then what we are doing. And that is that this is the, this is the detail. And of course it's Grace Now Ministries here in Port Elizabeth in South Africa. And I'm known by a couple of names. I belong to a church where I was known as Reverend Paul Weiss. I also Paul Weiss, Pastor Paul Weiss. My preference is just call me Paul. And then the other thing is that my telephone number, if you dial in internationally, plus 27, 8247300041. If you're dialing locally, 0824730041. My email is paul at gracenow.co.za. Our website is www.gracenow.co.za. But if you're receiving this, you're already in our uh, in connection with us so it's actually quite good and there's no need to um, have too many details because I just want to get into what we're busy with. Now today I'm dealing with the mind of Christ still because not only do I think that it is so important but I can tell you that people don't have the correct identity. They're taking instructions from God who spoke to Israel, who spoke to them when he condemned them, when he literally nailed them and he said if you don't do this i'm not going to bless you um so the nation of israel is the old testament and then when jesus speaks in the words of red in the bible in matthew mark luke and john many people think i'd rather follow jesus because he said those words now he was talking to the israelites and if you read it i just read the introduction to luke again just the first chapter there is so much that is focused on israel what for? To be the center of the focus of God, to fulfill his promises to Abraham of a kingdom on earth through loyal, faithful people. And of course, the Jews were never loyal, faithful and fulfilling what they should have been. And I'm going to touch on a verse that just says when Jesus dealt with, with the people, um, I'll highlight he's speaking to the Jews in the nation of Israel in the time of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. Now, the Old Testament if you read Hebrews 9, the New Testament was the conclusion of the animal sacrifices for the once forever death of Jesus Christ, who then takes over that role and begins to be the savior of the world that the shadow of those animals was. But in the book of Acts, leading into the book of Acts, the offer was still to the nation of Israel to be a kingdom to take a message of an earthly, physical kingdom on this earth to Israel first. In fact, it's Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. But only when Jerusalem, Judea, had actually come to know and understand who Christ was and had trusted him, could the kingdom begin to be established. But God also said, and this is interesting to me, I hope it is to you, he said, I'm going to place within you my spirit that will basically control your life. It's not as if it's like we have the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost. And by the way, the difference between Holy Spirit and Holy Ghost, and this is very interesting to me, the Holy Spirit relates to a spiritual function of God's Spirit, who is the third person of the Trinity, and that's the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Ghost is a more of a personal acknowledgement of his person. And the Bible uses both those terms, but the Holy Ghost is God's uh, decree or declaration of his personality 
and his person, not just his function. So having said that, I'm going to go back to our notes and we're going to go through this. I'm going to go through the notes that we covered last week and we're going to pick up on them, but I want to just deal with something that is important and that is our obedience. Um, let me get to it and let's have a look at it and we will get into what we're going to look at. So let's have a look here. Okay. We're dealing with the new mind in Christ. It's a massive topic, but an absolutely massive one because it's so beautiful. And we're not going to cover all of it, make no mistake, but you can get stuck into the scriptures because that's where you're going to find the new mind of Christ. Okay, one of the verses that we've looked at, and I want to just reflect on it again, naturally, is this book, the, the, the Second Corinthians chapter 10, verse from 5, and it actually precedes that a little bit, as all verses do. But it says the following, casting down imaginations. Now, very interestingly, that's a term that Paul uses quite often. Is not the term just imaginations, but he uses vain babblings. He uses vain imaginations. And basically, it's man's thoughts about God and his imagination running away with him. And you know that that is very prevalent today. You know, if you ask people and you say to them, well, tell me, um, what do you think God's like? Do you know that people will say, well, I think God never put his word in our hands so we could think who he was and ignore it and keep it on a shelf where it's dusted. But let me also say that reading the scriptures, if you think it's easy, it's not that it's not um, easy in the sense that sometimes when we read it, we want to know more and it raises questions. And sometimes it's just, there's almost like a barrier to getting to it. So that's very real and very true. So what Paul writes here and he says, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. In other words, there's knowledge of God and there's knowledge of other gods. And of course, the Bible is written, so we have the source of truth. If all roads really need to Rome, as they say, then is the Bible genuine? I'm going to take a verse later. In fact, after this on 2 Timothy, where it says there's only one mediator between God and man, and that's Christ Jesus. Now, let me just throw something in that's been a question, and I try to understand these things at a deeper level and reflect on them so that I'm not left in the mud and not knowing what's happening. But do you know one of the most beautiful things that I find in this whole aspect of the Lord is in fact the aspect of how the Lord deals with certain things, which include the fact that if Jesus Christ isn't the only way to heaven and isn't the only way to God, why did God, this multiplicity or ecumenical or multi-faith God, why did he let Christ go through the pain and suffering of the cross and the followers of Christ equally because they believed in him? Surely they could have said, now hang on guys, these, these, these Jews and Gentiles are getting a little bit too serious about the Lord that we serve and that's our Lord Jesus. So let's just change faith. Let's become something else. Let's not let them go to the cross. Why is it claimed that it was God and Christ and the Holy Spirit's purpose for him to go to the cross where God could pour out his just judgment on us and Christ could take that place. So what I'm saying is don't just, don't just think that all roads lead to Rome. It would make Christ a waste time. It would insult his person, his character, his being God in human form in the midst of us and suffering. The Bible says he was thirsty, he hungered, he felt pain, he suffered, he bled. Why would he have done that if you could just say, come on, guys, let's just believe in another form of God. It is either all or it is nothing. And I hope you prepared to understand that and let that difference be a part of your life where it's not that we are opposed to other faiths. It's that we know what we have found and we long for other people who are as precious as what words could ever describe to God, but he wants to bring them out of some of the things to show them that he is the only God. And listen to me now when I say this, please. 
He is the only God who says, you do nothing. I'll do everything because I'm not going to risk you not being with me in heaven. So I'm not putting you on performance because you mean so much to me. But I can only let you into heaven in the righteousness of my son that becomes yours when you trust him that he died for your sins, that he was buried. And that's why we know he was dead. Many people say, well, you know, maybe he just swooned. Maybe he wasn't really dead. Let me tell you, it wasn't a little child or a teenager who went and poked the sword in his side to kill him before they took him off the cross. It was a soldier who was completely confident about how to kill a man. And you normally bury a dead man. You put a, 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 a man who's swooning or just looks like he's out. You put him in a recovery bed. You don't put him in a tomb. So Jesus died. And why did he die? Because the wages of sin is death. And if he took our place, death was the consequence that he paid. And hence he died. But he was God. But he died on our behalf as well because that was the consequence of the judgment of sin that he took, which we will not die. We will, our physical body will come to an end. But let me tell you, and if you've ever been taught otherwise, please listen to me now and trust me, God created a universe. Do you think he's in a job of continually monitoring you and putting you under pressure and, well, have you done enough? And when you die, putting you in a place where it's a wait and see? Absolutely not. To, the scriptures say to us clearly in Paul's writings, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So that's how God works. And I promise you, if you've lost a loved one who said, I trust Christ, that he died for my sins in my place, took my judgment, and I trust him to have saved my soul from hell, I know I'm going to heaven. And let me tell you, you never have to think twice about whether he's there or not. He is, or she is, or your child is, because of their simple faith. Now, let's get back to what I wanted to read to you as well. And that is, of course, um, verse 6 of chapter 10 says, And having a, in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Now, we're getting to where I want to get to, but there's a couple of verses I want to cover first. And one of them that I do cover is obviously 1 Timothy 2, 2, and 3. And I'm going to give you the background just so it leads into it nicely. These are verses we'd look at another time maybe. But Paul writes to Timothy, because remember, it's Paul's message that is for us today. Now, what Jesus taught in the red letters, was he talking to you? No, he wasn't. He was talking to the nation of Israel. And if you try to apply it, you will never ever get it right you can try there are preachers who claim it on a national basis they get a million people together they think anything's better since that we've got COVID. since that our farm murders have increased i am honestly going to say something to you that maybe i shouldn't i am sick and tired of people following leaders that have missed the mark on understanding the scriptures they are taking verses instructions principles that are written to the jews for their little land and the nation of Israel that God wanted to make them this nation in a land that he had promised to, who did he promise it to? To David. He promised the spiritual side of Abraham becoming a nation of these people who would introduce to the rest of the world. They never did. They not only crucified Christ, that was part of a hidden agenda, but it was also something that they continued to persecute. They didn't only put Christ to death, they then stoned Stephen, who was also one of what we call the little flock, the believers in Christ, when the rest of the nation didn't want to know. They followed the religious leaders, and there's no difference to the religious leaders who don't understand what is known as Paul's revelation of the mystery, which is the gospel of grace, distinguished from that thing that is known as the kingdom message or the prophecy. Now, I must say, there are times when I just wish I could take an hour to speak to you, or maybe a lot more, but it's too much in a nutshell. So to Second Timothy, Paul writes, and he says, and listen to the words that follow, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in our sight of God our Savior, 
And then what does he say? Listen to these words because we have looked at it um, in a different sense. And that is that he says in 1 Timothy in verse 4 through to verse 6, what does God want? What does God want? Can I tell you, we forget what he wants. We think we have to perform. Do you think God needs our performance? Be honest with yourself. What have you got to offer him that he can't do? You know what you do have to offer him? Your soul so he can enjoy your presence with him in all eternity because Christ paid a price for your soul. Very different to people who think, I've got to be a good person. I've got to do this. I've got to make sure I do that. I've got to do these good works. Good works begin with the study of doctrine to understand. And that's where this passage again, just like the one in 2 Corinthians 10, listen to what T Timothy is told. In 1 Timothy 2, 4 to 6, it goes on and it says, after the verses I read, who will have all men to be saved. It is God's will that all men should be saved. He'll never send a person to a lost eternity. He can only be limited by if they trust him or not, because you have to trust Christ to get his righteousness to qualify you to enter heaven. So it says, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. Why does he say that? Because he doesn't say, you know what, just be saved and believe whatever you like and you know, whatever you believe, that's fine. No. What if your children turned into a street 10 blocks down, stopped at a house and said, well, I'm going to just treat these as my parents. They're not your parents unless they gave birth to you or they, they are your literal parents. So why does he say the knowledge of the truth? And can I say to you, let me pick up on that. Let me tell you, your children, if you've got children, I will guarantee you they have misread your protective care as you trying to just control and spoil their fun. And if they're not teenagers yet, maybe that's not quite as relevant or prevalent. But let me tell you, even as a child, when you take a sharp knife away from them because they can hardly walk, they don't think that there's a protective heart behind that. And let me tell you, that's why we have to come to a knowledge of the truth, to discover the love of God and the personal relationship with God. And from that come all these other things. It goes on and listen to these words. Did God make a mistake? Has he written a whole Bible? And is this Bible a book that has a whole lot of nonsense in it? Are the words of any meaning? If you're going to decide what the words of the Bible say, and let me tell you this, the King James Version is the only version in the English language that is accurate to the original manuscript. But can I tell you, if you're going to say, well, the Bible actually means that, do you know that you have just elevated your place to being the God of the Bible? That's why we have to know what we hold in our hands is accurate back to the original texts, which do not exist today, by the way, they were, they were not capable of lasting this long, but they were copied and they were copied and they were copied and they were copied by men who made it their life to get it right. But the King James Version is taken from what they call the Receptus Textus. It is also known as the Authorized Version. And in the English language, those manuscripts become the true perseverance of the retaining of the word of God through inspiration and preservation. So when God says this, you either believe he talks truth and his word is truth, or let me tell you, pack up your Christian life. Go and do whatever you want to do. Go live for anybody, anything, live your own life. And you know what the alternative to knowing Christ is? The first burden of knowing Christ is, what about my parents? What about my family? What about those? What about the guy I work with? He doesn't believe this. He doesn't understand this. He believes something that's really crazy. And boy, there's some crazy beliefs today, let me tell you. But it says, for there is one God. Only one God. There's no multi-faiths that lead to one God. There's only one means of reaching one God because one God made one plan to save you and me and every other person and that was that we should trust his son for what he did. So there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for just a few people who would believe, or that, no, no, who gave himself a ransom for all. 
to be testified in due time. And when Paul writes this to Timothy, and he says testified in due time, what it means is if you lived 100 years before Jesus came to this earth, he hadn't given himself yet. It had to be testified in due time. And what is due time? Due time is the understanding, the teaching, the preaching, the revelation of a message given to Paul the Apostle to bring this understanding of what I've just read to you about God wanting all men saved, not by following the law, not by doing the sacrifice of animals, but by trusting what they understand Christ's death was about, which is revealed more abundantly and beautifully and completely and fully including our identity in the Apostle Paul's writings, which is Romans leading on. Do we read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Of course we do. And I can promise you, in the last 12 months of my life, the more I read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the more beautifully it highlights Paul's message. Because Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus was talking. He had not died yet. He was still, he was still promoting the law and the sacrifices. So what we believe today, you can't mix it with that because it was a new message distinct from the old. And let me tell you, if a person makes animal sacrifices today, there's only one thing he's doing. He's not appeasing God. He's not saying, well, God, I want to do it the way he used to do it. I mean, can I tell you what he's doing? He's taking the creator of the universe in the second person called Christ. You know what he's doing? He's insulting him worse than a thief and a liar because what he's saying is that, no, I want to do it the old way. I know the old way was a shadow of you, but you know what? I prefer sacrificing an animal. On a lighter note, <laughs> an animal makes a nice bry. If you're going to cook him on a barbecue, as the Americans call it, let me tell you, then you can sacrifice an animal, but it's a, not a sacrifice to God. It is a pleasure of enjoying uh, lamb chop. Uh, what's the best one? The best one is the loin chops on a fire and enjoying and I love the fact more than anything and by the way let me tell you this because it's been something I was very glad to read many years ago and that is that when Passover came do you know that those who were part of Passover they killed the lamb and they put the blood around the door of their house if they believed in the God of Jesus I'm um, sorry in the God of Israel if they believed in this God he was going to pass over the houses when he wiped out the people that were holding the nation of Israel at their mercy in Egypt. So it was the Passover. So you put the blood of the animal on the doorposts and it's all in the Old Testament read and it's, it's very fascinating. The Passover was commenced and every year it was remembered that God had delivered them out of Egypt and through the sea that they went through, the enemy was destroyed, but the sea parted to get them through. Now many people say, is that really so? Yes, it was really so, because if God's word says it, remember, it's not only in the person who writes it, it's in many other authors who knew of it, but they were part of that nation. So they were not stories that were reflected and not true, because there were many people in that circle who actually had experienced that. And he gave himself, when he came to this earth, at the end of his life, a ransom for all. And Paul the Apostle is given the spiritual victory of that in a way that wasn't you Israels have actually destroyed the Son of Man, which that was Peter's message after he died, after he had been resurrected. And Peter, the Apostle Peter, challenges the nation of Israel and says, you men of wicked hands have crucified the Son of Man. In other words, they did not see the victory that we have where we say, I'm going to heaven. I'm not going to stay on this earth as part of a kingdom. I'm going to heaven because Jesus Christ purchased for me a place by his shed blood on the cross of Calvary. And although nobody understood it completely, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 2, 7 and 8. And let me read it to you because I think it is so important as I wrap up. And I'm going to have to come back to this. I hope you don't mind. But honestly and truly, I hope that there's an understanding that's taking place that we are distinct from the Jews. We are distinct from the um, teaching that was specifically to the Jews. Today, whether you're Jew, Gentile, male, female, it doesn't matter. You have to place your faith in Christ. You are saved in the body of Christ. And you're going to heaven. But to the Jews and Israel at that stage, had they believed, they would have become the nation on this planet, in the kingdom, 
that were the vessel and the vehicle of this message. We, nobody would have gone to heaven like after Christ died. And Paul is revealed this message where now it's about heaven for us, but not for the nation of Israel in prophecy. But today, if a Jew believes that Jesus Christ died for his sins, was buried and rose again, as 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 4 declare, then let me tell you, he's going to be part of the heavenly thing because he's in Christ. But to the Jews at that stage of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, if they believed in who Christ was as the Messiah, they would have been part of a kingdom on earth. So please, I'm, I'm sorry I've overemphasized that, but I don't want anybody to misquote me on it. So this verse speaks about that. And in Colossians 3, 10, it says... You and I, in this newness that God has given us through the writings of Paul. Remember, Paul wrote it. Paul was an instrument. He was not the initiator. He was not the author. He was not the person who understood and created this message. He was simply the scribe. He was simply the man who wrote it. But God chose him because he had been a killer of the, of the little flock. He had be, he'd killed those followers of Jesus. And I... I'm not saying this is what God says, but to me, if you want to show grace, pick the most guilty man and just forgive him. And he's going to know what grace is. And that's what will happen with Paul. Anyway, Colossians 3.10 says, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Isn't that beautiful? Do you think that your parents created you? No. Nah. God created the human race, if I can call it that. He created you because he brought life into the union of two cells at a point of conception. And you know what? He knew who you would be. But when he died on the cross, he knew he had made provision for you in heaven because he knew you would live now. And God knows all things, but his knowledge doesn't make him do all sorts of things. People blame God and, you know, well, God should have changed this, or God should have made the car swerve before it killed my daughter. No, God doesn't control us. He presents us with truth. He says, if you believe it, you're still part of a world. That's a problem. But let me tell you, I will be with you, and I will lead you through it so that your children know who I am, and you will see them again in heaven, even if they lose their lives. Now, let me tell you, and I'm going to say something here that's, that's pretty harsh. You know that people will dedicate their lives to funds, money, policies for their children's education so they can become educated through an institution. But let me tell you, if your children are not educated in the spiritual truth of God's word and the salvation that's offered in Jesus Christ, they're going to live in this world. They may be the finest doctor. Probably there's a bit of arrogance that goes with it. There's normally all sorts of things that go with too much qualification and education. People become an arrogance and an ego vessel that just thinks they're better than everybody. And I'm not saying everybody does. Please don't misunderstand me. I'd hate you to do that. But let me tell you, the gospel humbles you because it says, I don't care if you're the king and I don't care if you're the beggar. I don't care if you're the pauper or the street sweeper. You're a sinner and only I can fix that. Having said what I've said, I'm going to come back to this next week again. I hope and I know that I'm not repetitive in what I'm presenting to you. I may not be teaching scripture after scripture after scripture, but the concepts and the principles that I share with you, I promise you, I have discovered them to be the key to why this, these lungs of mine are filled with breath, because it's the greatest thing in the world. You are, not, you are not at the mercy of people's opinions or you're not at the mercy of people who may not think anything of you because you don't have a degree or you don't have a certificate or you don't have a, an achievement. Can I tell you? Your greatest achievement is to be you as God made you and live that out in His grace with His Holy Spirit within, being part of the body of Christ in Him for all eternity from the day we trust. The Lord bless you, and I trust that what I've said to you today is not too harsh or not too controversial. But you know what? My worry is that if people get this wrong, if we were to get it wrong, 
and we didn't learn something about the truth of eternity and the spiritual part of our lives and how God works in that, as I said earlier, you can give your children the best education. You can give, you can provide comfort for them. There's no way in the scriptures where it says we have to have cars. God gave us two legs. He didn't give us a steering wheel. But you know what? We can provide for that because we're hardworking. We honor the Lord in what we do. And we're wise in how we utilize what we do have. So there's nothing wrong with those things. Paul writes and he says, withdraw from those who say that gain is godliness. People say, if you give to God, he's going to give to you. No, no, that's trading. That's trading off. Okay, God, I'll give you this. Will you give it? God doesn't operate that way. What God does do is he says, withdraw from them who say that gain is godliness. First Timothy 6, read it. And I promise you, it's eye-opening compared to what you will hear from many preachers, televangelists that are going to tell you another story. And you know what my fear is and my reality is? And I'm going to use them as an example. I fall into the same category. If they stand before the Lord and what they have taught is not biblical and they've taught it in the name of Christ, they can't undo the error of their ways. But God knows what it has been. And that's why there's only one way, the word of God. That is the only way to go because God said, I created this world. I created your life. I created everything. So if you want to do something about getting your life right, why don't you try going to the manufacturer's manual, which is the word of God. I hope it's been helpful. I must say, I enjoy chatting to you. Um, please don't forget that you are extremely precious to the Lord. And he longs for you to celebrate the fullness, the completeness, and the peace that he gives you, which is not majoring in minors as most people do. It's looking at your first and primary purpose to know the word of God. And your second one, is to be the vessel that carries this message of the grace of God. Thank you for your attention, and I hope that the scriptural accuracy of what is presented is meaningful to you. May God richly bless you in Christ as you trust Him. All the best. Mm -hmm.